Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. We've got a, a number of questions that we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll take as little of your time as possible, but enough time so that uh, our audience members uh, who submitted a lot of questions uh, will be satisfied. First question, um, most, these are anonymous for the large part, large, most part, so I'm, I'm not going to identify anybody who's, who's, uh, who's written their name down, but a two-part question, hopefully related. What do you consider your toughest issue in the upcoming campaign? How do you plan to deal with it? And if reelected, what will be your priorities in the second term? Uh, as you know, I, I just said that we are negotiating several agreements. We may be able to accomplish some of them before the end of the year. So we will proceed to deal with the rest. And um, uh, in addition to economic issues, cultural issues are also very important. In our negotiation with the mayor last year, we concluded an agreement on protection of intellectual property rights. But so far, the cultural exchange between the two sides are still hampered by uh, a lot of uh, regulations. For instance, we already reached an agreement between Taiwan and the mainland to uh, export uh, films to the other side. And there's no limit for a Taiwanese film going to the mainland. But so far, not a single film has been allowed to, to be shown. For mainland China, there is a limit of 10 films a year. So far, we have already shown some. So there is a gap between the uh, understanding of the two sides on some of the cultural exchange items. That's going to be a very important one for the two sides. And so far, we haven't got any agreement on publications, books, or other uh, items in this regard. So we do have many uh, things that we have to tackle. Uh, uh, if I get elected uh, uh, next year, and uh, we'll slowly move into other areas. But so far, those are the most urgent and most important ones for us. Uh, <laughs> I guess the question, the question is, what's, uh, what's your toughest challenge as you look forward to, uh, to the election? What do, you, what do you see that's out there that is, is the biggest obstacle to re-election? Well, as you know, we always have some difficulties with the mainland on things that uh, touches upon issues uh, of uh, you know, sovereignty or other things. As you know, recently we, we did have some difficulties in this regard. But I think by and large, uh, the two sides under the principles of uh, 92 consensus uh, are ready to negotiating things in a way that is mutually acceptable. You know, we have had difficulties when we uh, negotiate the uh, ECFA with the mainland. Even in the language, language the terms we use, uh, you're an expert in ma Mandarin Chinese, you understand. The framework, the English word framework, is translated in Taiwan as jia go, but in mainland it's kuang jia. So we call this a framework agreement with different translations, and that is the point. Uh, neither side could, uh, you know, make any concession. And there are several terms that have this problem. So eventually, when we sum up or wrap up the uh, agreement, just uh, the two sides came up with an interesting solution. The, 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 they add one sentence after Article 16, which is the last article of ECFA, by providing that all the corresponding terms that have different expression means the same. Just one sentence that takes a all. You see, sometimes when the teams negotiating for quite a while and sometimes will spark interesting uh, conclusions which solve the problem just right away. So I think as the negotiations continue in the future, certainly more mutual trust will be built as a result. Thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, a question on the defense budget. Uh, uh, the defense budget has obviously been cut uh, recently. Um, I guess the question is: Will will you increase it to three percent of GDP as as earlier um, um, suggested? 
Yes, we did uh, hope we could have 3% of our GDP as our uh, defense budget. And we made it in 2008, 2009, but we, we were not able to do it in 2009 and 2010. Why? Because of the uh, financial tsunami and economic downturn. But for the, uh, the coming year, uh, we are still unable to do it, but the absolute amount is more than that of last year's budget. The only problem is last year, the GDP grew at 10.82%, which is a record in 23 years. And that makes it very difficult for the military budget to grow at the same speed. But believe me, we have already made um, adequate arrangement, not just for the procurement of weaponry from the United States, but for our own plans to have a, uh, a voluntary military force. So the absolute number is more than that of last year, but the percentage is still uh, behind the uh, expected uh, 3%. So we will try you know, in the future to catch up with that. But I can assure you, we do have the resolve to defend ourselves. And we try other ways to continue strengthen our soldiers, our forces, and our um, way of uh, making a viable defense. On the other hand, another issue of uh, uh, income distribution will be also will also be an important election topic. And in the last year or so, we have tried very hard to increase our social welfare program so that more people will benefit from, from the fast uh, developing economy. And also, we use a variety of ways to um, uh, keep the prices uh, stable. As a matter of fact, we, our uh, the, the uh, consumer price index in Taiwan is the lowest in Asia, next only to that of Japan. Although people's feeling a little bit different because you know uh, the econo economists uh, use a different method to uh, as the samples, but by and large, I think we will do our best to keep the the gap between the rich and the poor as low as possible. It's not easy, but compared to other ethnic Chinese society, I think Taiwan's income distribution is probably the best. Uh, but on the other hand, we're not satisfied with the status quo. We'll continue to do that through a variety of ways. As you know, the um, unemploy unemployment rate in Taiwan uh, has uh, been down for a consecutive uh, 19 months. Now it stood at 4.48%, the lowest in 29 months. And we expect to see it continue to go down in the next couple of months. So that will help uh, to get more people jobs. And in recent uh, months, actually the complaint from the market, from the companies that Actually, there's a shortage of labor, particularly skilled labor, as a result of a fast uh, economic recovery. So all these problems we have, you know, had a chance to debate with our opponents in the coming election. Thank you. That was very comprehensive. This question is, is from a self-identified mainland China scholar and, uh, dis and wants a discussion on the, the future political talks uh, across the strait. Uh, Two-part question, what serves as the political and social foundation for the beginning uh, of political talks? And then secondly, what is the one thing you'd most expect the mainland to do to make such talks possible for the mutual benefit of both sides? In concluding the 15 agreements in the last three years, uh, once in a while we will touch issues that it's not it's not the, by nature a political one, but sometimes it's political uh, meaning or significance, as I just mentioned, the wording, for instance. So 
we have uh, t we have handled that, you know, in the last three years. But we at the moment do not consider it is the most urgent thing to tackle uh, the sort of uh, uh, pure political issues, for instance, sovereignty or confidence building measures. Those are important. Those are not in excluded in our agenda. But obviously, at the moment, we don't have any timetable for that. As I repeatedly said, our hands are full with all those issues that are deeply involved with our people's livelihood. As you know, the eight years before we took office, a lot of things were, were actually, um, was actually left idle without any progress. And what we have been doing in the last three years is really to make up the lost eight years. So far, we haven't finished that job yet. For instance, Taiwan and the Chinese mainland last year has a uh, bilateral trade of uh, more than 150 billion US dollars. For two economies of a bilateral trade of this magnitude, after so many years, then we had a ECFA. This is really unthinkable in other occasions, in other parts of the world. But it happened because of the very uh, uh, strange political relations between the two sides. So we want to institutionalize the cross-trade interaction so that gradually the two sides can, can interchange, can interact with each other in a way a normal uh, economic entities do. Thank you. Um, next question uh, on confidence building measures in military affairs between the mainland and Taiwan. What are the prospects for military to military CBMs at this point? Well, a military uh, confidence building measures require a political foundation. So it is, in essence, a political CBM. As I said, along the Along the way from the, the three years ago in uh, concluding so many agreements, 15 of them, we do achieve some kind of confidence building in the process. Uh, if, we, if I remember correctly, three years ago when we first started, actually the negotiating team didn't even know each other. But three years later, uh, many people in a different ministries across Taiwan trade could just pick up the phone and call their counterparts in solving some of the problems. This is something we certainly would like to see more so that we don't have to uh, confine all the contacts to the, the Straight Exchange Foundation or to uh, the Association for Relations Across Taiwan Strait, ARATS and the SEF. In other words, the uh, different ministries and their different ministries could always uh, contact each other on issues of a minor importance. So the two sides is gradually building uh, collectively, jointly, a net of relationship that could handle problems right away when it occurs. Thank you. Um, the, the process of rapprochement on the economic side or uh, generally with, with the mainland is, is certainly a difficult uh, diplomatic and political dance. On the one hand, you have um, a certain percentage of, of the population on Taiwan that is inherently suspicious or nervous about greater coming together across the strait through the embodiment of the ECFA and other agreements. And then you have the, the mainland that's inherently suspicious and, and, un, and displeased about the military relationship with the United States. Uh, I guess the question is, how do you um, – how do you square these conflicts, and what role, if any, does the military relationship pl with the United States play in either setting a political tone in Taiwan that allows a rapprochement or otherwise? Well, by and large, the people in Taiwan generally support our security relations with the United States. They also support our economic relations with the mainland. And I'm sure you are aware that in the last more than 20 years, in the opinion polls we have uh, conducted, uh, the 
the vast majority of the people support maintenance of the status quo, more than 70 or even 80 percent. So in other words, uh, they understand that uh, there's no chance for either the supporters of the jury independence or reunification to prevail in current, under current circumstances. So most of the people in Taiwan are pragmatic enough to understand the need to maintain security ties with the United States. And that not only means uh, purchasing arms, but also for other security cooperation. We also understand very well that men in China is vehemently opposed to that. But we keep telling them that um, it is very important to keep the balance across Taiwan Strait. And there are quite a few uh, military hardware we cannot manufacture locally. And those are basically uh, defensive in nature. And they are purchased to really replace the aging items we have in our uh, uh, arsenal. So I think this is a very important for the two sides of the Taiwan, Taiwan Strait and the United States to understand. A uh, right military balance across Taiwan Strait is vital to peace and stability. And our relations with the United States will not hamper our relations with the mainland. I said it in my speech that I want to create a virtuous cycle so that the uh, deepening of relations with the mainland could also help our international participation. And an expanded participation in the international community would also help our people to have more confidence and more interest in developing a uh, deeper relations with the Chinese mainland. We, we ha I have used many occasions to prove that the virtual circle is not a uh, uh, something that uh, I wish for thinking. It is a matter of fact. Uh, thank you. A question, a question about um, internal domestic Taiwan politics. Um, at least those of us from the outside observe a rather sharp divide in 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 the political basis in in, in China, or excuse me, in Taiwan. And the question is: Is there a is there a means to bridge that divide? And if so, what are you doing, or what can you do to bridge it? That is a job we have to do com uh, constantly. Every policy involving uh, cross-strait relations, we have to do the kind of uh, uh, public communication. But let me just. Uh, take the process of uh, negotiating ECFA with the Chinese mainland as an example. It started actually two years ago when we announced that uh, we want to negotiate such an economic cooperation agreement with the mainland. The first response from the populace uh, is not that enthusiastic because the uh, general populace didn't understand what it means. So we, it took us uh, almost a whole year to do the public communication. And we also asked a think tank to come up with econometric uh, statistics. But again, people didn't know what's going on. So last year, just about this time of year, when the uh, chairwoman of DPP said they want to debate with me on this issue, I said, why not? I accept right away against the uh, advice of many of my friends. They said, this is unprecedented. I said, I want to take that opportunity to really make my people understand what EPA means to Taiwan. So it gave me a golden opportunity to outline what we have in mind in negotiating uh, such an agreement with the mainland. So after the debate, the support rate shot up because people now understand what we're going to have. But still, because before we came up with the actual contents of the agreement, people still have some doubts. So uh, roughly two months later, before we signed the agreement, we have to report that to our national parliament. And we let people know 
they are 539 uh, export items from Taiwan to the mainland and 267 from mainland to Taiwan. So they immediately understand which section of the business will be affected. By then, the support rate is uh, well uh, above 50 or 60 percent. So it takes time to do the uh, public communication. It's not that easy. For instance, another one is to allow men and students to come to our university campuses. Again, the DPP opposed that vehemently. But then the university professors, presidents, came out to support that. They say, listen, we need competition. We need to open up our campuses for competition. And this is the best way for the two sides to understand each other, that is to let the young people to get to know each other at an early stage of their life. You see, they are uh, impartial and rational voices in the society that will come up. So after that, we pass the necessary law, and that will become a reality a couple of months from now. Um, thank you. Um, the Taiwan Relations Act is now 32 years old, and you've started to see at least some public commentary in the United States, albeit I think still very much fringe uh, commentary, questioning the basis of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship and questioning the U.S. interest in a continued relationship with Taiwan that we've sustained. How would you suggest or how would you recommend that the United States and Taiwan continue to improve our relationship so that these kinds of questions are, are laid to rest? Uh, obviously, Taiwan Relations Act is a successful uh, piece of legislation. Uh, throughout the last 32 years, so many American presidents, uh, in, in spite of their political parties or their political beliefs, they all support that. And two years ago, when we uh, commemorized the 30th anniversary, almost everyone says that's a great legislation. Of course, they have to be other actions or commitments along with the Taiwan Relations Act. For instance, uh, the August 17th communique in 1982 between Washington and Beijing, where the U.S. made some commitment. But the U.S. also made the six assurances to Taiwan that there's no deadline for the sale, sale of uh, defensive weapons to Taiwan, and no consultation will be held between Washington and Peking before the action, before a decision is made. You know, and the U.S. will not play the role of a mediator between the two sides. All this uh, very solid, very concrete assurances becomes a very important cornerstone of peace and stability in this part of the world. We certainly appreciate very, very much. We understand the TRA is just a domestic legislation. It's not a treaty. But U.S. government, president, seems to be very faithful in implementing the contents of Taiwan relations. Okay. On behalf of the government and people of this country, I really want to express my deep appreciation to the American government and people. We have, we have time just for one last question, Mr. President, and then we want to let you make any concluding comments. So one last question, and then we will wrap it up. I guess the, the last question, uh, and you've been extraordinarily generous with your time already, and um, as we've asked these rather broad and difficult questions. Um, the final question is, uh, relates to beyond ECFA, uh, Taiwan's economic relations with the rest of Asia and, and, and beyond. What, is the, what are the prospects for, for a, a free trade agreement or its equivalent with Singapore or other countries, other economies? Um, and to what extent uh, does Beijing have an effective veto on such free trade agreements? Uh, certainly, the, uh, the conclusion of ECFA is the first step for Taiwan to rejoin regional economic integration in this part of the world. Before that, Taiwan and North Korea were the only two countries that have not participated in the regional economic integration in East Asia. When we finish ECFA, 
just uh, almost immediately, many countries in the region expressed an interest to discuss with us the potentials of having a similar arrangement or other type of arrangement relating to economic uh, problems. So this is a very important step for Taiwan, actually, to join, uh, to come back to the uh, uh, economic landscape in this part of the world. Now, we are negotiating a similar agreement with Singapore, and we are making some progress, but it takes some time. On the other hand, other countries in the region also express an interest. So we are uh, assessing the, the pros and cons and also the uh, economic uh, uh, situation of the countries involved to see whether it is in the two sides best interest to do that. I, I'm sure the what happened between Taiwan and, uh, and then in China also have some uh, impact on the relations of other countries with us and with the mainland. But by and large, this is a uh, virtuous cycle. In other words, uh, let me just give you an example. For the first quarter of this year, the trade between Taiwan and the mainland went up 15%. But our trade with ASEAN countries went up more than 30%. Our trade with the US, again, went up more than 30%. Sounds a little bit ironic. We signed an agreement with the mainland, but other countries also benefit from the side effect. This is exactly what we want. We want to diversify our export market, not just with the mainland. But mainland continues to be our largest trading partner, our largest export market, our largest uh, sort of um, uh, uh, the, the surplus uh, earner country. So we will continue the very very uh, mutually beneficial relationship. As I said, we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket, but we can't really leave no eggs in one of the largest basket of the world. Nicely put. Uh, Mr. President, you've been extraordinarily generous. I'll, I'll ask you to, to uh, have any final words that, that you might have, and then I'll turn it back over to my boss for uh, his uh, his, uh, his offerings of, of good day. Uh, my closing remark. Dear friends and colleagues, as the famous American poet Robert Frost once wrote, I took the road less traveled by, it, and that has made all the difference. The past three years have witnessed unprecedented breakthroughs and positive developments in Taiwan and the region. Yet, for the road ahead, we will, still, we will need to be patient and careful in our political rhetoric, in the signals we send, in the gestures we make, and in the reputation we cultivate. I draw reassurances from the positive developments that continue to unfold across the strait and in the international community. And I have full confidence in my administration's roadmap. On a deeper level, the improvement of cross-strait relations in the past three years reflects the result of something fundamentally more significant. The comprehensive overhaul of Taiwan's strategic approach to the world, an approach that has coupled cross-strait relations, the economy, and foreign relations together in such a way as to fully maximize Taiwan's potential value in the global community. Taiwan has to transform itself into a peacemaker, a contributor of humanitarian aid, a center for innovation and business opportunities, a major promoter of cultural exchange, and the standard bearer of Chinese culture. As the Republic of China reaches its centennial anniversary, I believe my administration's grand strategy will make the Republic more secure, more prosperous for many, many years to come. I also firmly believe America's friendship will be an inseparable part of the Republic of China's future, as it has been in the past 100 years. Thank you very much.
President Ma, thank you for this rare privilege. It's been an oper a real privilege to have you with us. Uh, I know I've been watching the faces of the audience here. You have deeply engaged everyone, and we want to thank you for taking the time to do this today. You know, all societies have only three ways to make major decisions. You know, the, you make it in a marketplace where a good is priced and you decide if you want to buy it or not, or somebody will decide if they want to produce it at that or lower price. That's one way. A second way, of course, is in an administrative proceeding. You've established the rules of the road in a court or some administrative proceeding, and if there's a problem, you go there. The only other way that societies make major decisions is through politics. Politics is so crucial because it's where you take the complex aspirations of a people and you turn it into a concrete agenda. But politics is about leadership, not following. You know, too many politicians are followers, not leaders. And I think this morning we've had a chance to see a man who's a, a leader, a leader who created a vision, a very powerful vision. It's not necessarily always popular but it is making a profound change. And we are deeply grateful for what you're doing, Mr. President, and sharing your insights with us. Thank you, and we wish you a very pleasant Thank evening. Thank you so much.